We are starting the last segment of the conference with our, another of our distinguished guests. It's a real pleasure to have Jean-Paul Fitoussi at this conference and especially to hear him talk us, to us tonight. I've suggested that he speak about Europe and I, will imagine, I imagine that he will be talking in some part about France. <clears throat> Jean-Paul was born in Tunisia and went to Strasbourg for his higher education, his PhD. It's no exaggeration to say that his career very quickly skyrocketed. I think it's correct to say that early on, he became a professor at Sciences Po and a protege, if that's not a bad word, of uh, President Mitterrand. When OFCE, the research institution, was created, he was soon named a president of the research institute at a pretty young age. <clears throat> he was mostly engaged in the heavy work of that position over the next several decades until um, 2015 or so. Now, much of his time is devoted to helping the building of Luis, the still very young university in Rome. It would be no exaggeration to say that he has had a spectacular career. Jean-Paul is one of my very closest friends. We got to know each other over academic year 85-86 in the idyllic setting of the European University Institute in Fiesole up the hill from Florence, Firenze for the Italians in the room. While the US economy was recovering, France was in a malaise. Jean-Paul and I started a book together that year called The Slump in Europe, and pretty soon Jean-Paul was finding ways to invite me to do research with him in Paris. I can speak with some authority when I say that he is an amazing figure. There are very few people in the world who can do 10 things a day for 30 or 40 years. In this time, besides teaching at Sciences Po and running OFCE, he was an advisor to a succession of presidents up to uh, former President uh, Hollande. In these years, he also found time to be, for several decades, Secretary General of the International Economic Association. <clears throat> and he ran the advisory board <clears throat> of economists for the EBRD the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. He also conceived and formed the International Policy Evaluation Group, a research group at OFCO that included Robert Solo, Anthony Atkinson, Olivier Blanchard, John, John Fleming, and myself, <clears throat> which uh, resulted uh, in the book Competitive Disinflation. Perhaps he is most cited these days <clears throat> for the book he and Joe Stiglitz authored, Mismeasuring Our Lives, which is an attack on the GDP as a sufficient measure of, of the performance of uh, economies and nations. Without further ado, let me turn the microphone over to Jean-Paul.
Well, what to say after this uh, warm word? Thank you very much, Ned. Thank you very much, Richard, because I am here on your invitation. I am also proud to be a member of the center. Um, if you still want uh, of me. Uh, I know that you have had a, a fairly long day, a fairly long day, and a, a, a very interesting day where intellectual food wa was very abundant. And so I will not um, uh, be long. Anyway, I am always following the advice of Montesquieu when he said that what a speaker does not give you in depth, it gives you in length. So, so I'm trying to keep that uh, uh, in um, 15 minutes. So uh, I want to speak to you of a problem which uh, is linked to uh, uh, what uh, we heard today. It is linked indirectly and also directly. So I changed my mind vis-a-vis uh, <laughs> -vis the subject that uh, Ned uh, asked me to present, but I will speak uh, about Europe. So uh, <laughs> I want to speak about the threats to democracy. And uh, I am seeing that uh, today, I am observing like everybody, that democracy is in danger. First, there is the development of what is called illiberal democracy in the Eastern country. And the, in, in French, we say democrature, you know, the contraction of democracy and dictature. So that has developed in many countries of Europe. And it is developing also in Austria now. Um, it could have been the case that France would be in this situation because it has not been a long time that uh, uh, Le Pen had uh, uh, 11 million votes, 11 million votes which is um, enormous. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I, I have tried to understand why it is like that. And so uh, I will uh, tackle the question um, uh, according to free angle. The first is inequality. What is clear is that it our world, there is a, a huge increase and an universal increase in inequalities. This increase in inequality has as an effect to render democracy much more fragile because democracy and what I call market democracy It's a combination of two principles, the universal suffrage and the principle of a market. Universal suffrage, one person, one vote, the principle of a market, one dollar, one vote. And so our system can survive only by compromising. If it does not compromise, or we will go too far toward inequalities, or we will go 
too far toward an authoritarian state. There was a, a judge of the Supreme Court of the US, uh, Judge Brandeis, who said in 1941, you can have in this country democracy or you can have fortune, wealth, concentrated in a few hands. But you can't have both. And I think uh, he's right. This uh, attitude toward democracy may lead to a constitution of faction, may lead to populism, may lead to what we are observing today, violence. Our society are becoming more violent than they were uh, some times ago. <laughs> the second point uh, of entry uh, of my subject on democracy is Europe. Europe. Europe is a strange construction in uh, the uh, um, um, space of the political regimes. Why it is a strange construction? Because it is a construction which, uh, um, uh, uh, which creates a hiatus between legitimacy and power. Legitimacy came, comes from the vote of the people. And the nation of Europe are submitted to the voting process. Uh, <coughs> power comes from the rule on which the uh, uh, European country have agreed once and uh, uh, that implies that the uh, space of sovereignty is empty. Uh, to take an example, no uh, fiscal policy, no monetary policy, no exchange rate policy, uh, <coughs> but also limited power of uh, the European uh, institution once they are considered as overpassing their mandate. Remember that Mario Draghi was uh, pursued by the Constitutional Court. And that leads to a system which is almost totally blocked totally blocked because the only right that people have retained is to change government. Through their vote, they may change government. But they can't change the course of policy. Policy is no more in the end of a government which is elected by uh, <laughs> the people. Of course, there is one element of policy that they still have under their sovereignty is structural reforms. But structural reforms may mean a lot of things. And in the European context, structural reform meet, uh, means the search for competitiveness. So we are confronted to a bizarre union where you come together to have a commercial war. And uh, all countries have participated to this war. France has begun with uh, competitive disinflation, which was uh, a way of depreciating, in real term, the uh, uh, French franc. Then Germany, with Schroeder, has done the same. 
through uh, a reform of labor market and through wage moderation. So uh, <laughs> the problem is that uh, it does not seem possible to reach an equilibrium in this system. And if it does not possible, it seems not to be possible to reach an equilibrium, it is because the rules are such that there is no sovereignty and that there is no way, no means for the government to fight inequalities. Why? How to fight inequalities if the only remedy you, you have is to decrease the welfare state, is to decrease social protection? I have almost the impression that I am doing a minority report, but that's okay. Uh, the, the, the third point uh, of entry to my subject is the consequence of um, economic policy on the variable we are not measuring. You know, uh, we think that um, in a democracy some objectives are natural and some are less important. Among the Natural objective are human development, full employment, stability, and so on and so forth. But uh, when you look, and also sustainability, because uh, uh, parents care about the future of their children, sustainability is fairly important. But how to measure sustainability in this uh, <coughs> framework? Usually, the Europeans have defined sustainability looking only at the level of public debt. Only at the level of public debt. So that's uh, a bit strange because debt is only one element of a balance sheet of a nation. It's not the whole element, the whole balance sheet of the wealth of a nation. So assume an austerity policy as the one we have had in Europe until now. Assume an austerity policy, the result may be, but it has not been, may be a uh, uh, decrease in public debt. But it is certainly a decrease in human capital, a decrease in social capital, and a decrease in natural capital. To give just one example, it is as if we are paying one point of decrease of a public debt by 20 points of decrease of human capital uh, social capital, etc. Because you know that I am speaking of a continent where the rate of uh, youth unemployment is incredibly high, higher than it was in the 30s. In Greece, it's 50%. In uh, <coughs> Italy, it's something like 40%. In France, it is 25%, but that are fairly high level. And above all, what is happening now in, in Europe is that the other part of human capital, I mean health, is deteriorating. How do we know that it is de deteriorating? It, because infant mortality has increased in the uh, uh, south, uh, south, southern country of Europe, and because life expectancy has decreased in most 
country of Europe. So, to finish, I want just to say, uh, what is the relation with individualism? The truth is that I don't know. <laughs> but I, I can say that um, uh, the relationship, what I am saying, is that pure individualism can't exist. Individualism needs institution to be implemented and needs democracy. It is the only way uh, to uh, 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 individualism, unless you prefer democratic. Thank you very much. I'm sure Jean-Paul would be happy to entertain a question or two. Patricia. I congratulate you for innovating again and again, Professor of E2C. Um, if you were given the power to have one policy over the UE, of having one policy power over European Union, what would you do? according to your reflections, to your insights. It's a terrible, it's a terrible question. <laughs> because if I knew it, I will be in government. I don't know what is the answer, although it's a bit of a lie. I know what is not the answer. Uh, Austerity policy in time of recession is not the answer. <coughs> Austerity policy in time of booming unemployment is not an answer. There is uh, <coughs> balance we have to look at between the bargaining power of the enterprise and of a working, I was to say class, but it looks very Marxist if I say class, and the, the, the working class. So um, we know what, not, what we should not do. We know also that what is missing in Europe is a government. We knew that from the outset, it's, it's obvious. If we have all these problems, that because we are confronted to uh, an ensemble of uh, federated states, often of a federation. There is no federal state. So we know how to proceed, but you know, between what an intellectual can say and what a politician will do, there is a big difference. Another question? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe you should stand up. Okay. Thanks so very much for this. My friend Eric Beinhocker at Oxford, he heads the Institute for New Economic Thinking at Ox Oxford. Uh, recently proposed a different structure for the EU where there were two levels of membership. One was a, me a level that was akin to what we have today where you could or could not use the euro and the other was a looser level of membership which was more akin to the uh, Commonwealth uh, or the Euro European Economic Community that we of yesteryear. Uh, what are your thoughts on such a bi-level uh, uh, structure uh, in the EU. Yeah, that is uh, uh, what is known as a two-speed yeah. Europe. Hmm? One will, which will go uh, very far, the euro area, if it creates the institution, and uh, <coughs> Emmanuel Macron 
did propose this institution. And this institution, according to Emmanuel Macron, should be composed by a parliament of the euro area and by a, a, a minister of finance of the euro area and the uh, and, uh, and fiscal authority for the euro area. And it is also proposing that to alleviate the burden when there is a shock, we can, for example, <laughs> mutually mutualize the unemployment benefits for uh, the whole Europe. But basically, it's the idea that your friend is developing. Is there one more question? All right, Peter. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Edmond, okay, okay. Edmond is coming okay. Uh, excuse me, Peter. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, Jean-Paul. Uh, you you use the word sustainability. What? And I would like to uh, raise a question about sustainability uh, under the con in the context of environments. Uh, and and related to the topic of this uh, of this uh, um, of this event today, which is about individualism. Uh, the paradigm about, uh, upon which the, the market economy is based uh, comes from Adam Smith, uh, which uh, borrowed it, who borrowed it from uh, the, um, Bernard Mandeville, the, the, the famous Fables of the Bees, uh, which is, in fact, that uh, when you act for your own interest, you act in the interest of the community. And in fact, uh, that has been challenged many times. The first one was Malthus and even Keynes. But obviously today, even in a country like China, it is the basis of uh, the, 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 the policies which are pursued. Now, the question is, and it's a very, very troublesome question, uh, uh, given uh, the the, the, the rise of the external, negative externalities, which we see with pollution and climate change. Uh, is it true that individualism uh, is the answer and the market economy is doing the right job concerning the evolution uh, of, uh, of the world? And so I raise the question because I think it is really very, a very important question. I would like to have your your, your reaction on that, uh, Jean-Paul. Okay. Edmond, you began, you began by saying that uh, uh, if you act in our own interest, you have the invisible hand of Adam Smith, which make you work for the community. But the example you, you, you choose is exactly uh, proving the contrary. If you want to cope with the pollution problem, for example, you will uh, put a carbon tax on um, the product of uh, uh, France, on, on the emission of gas. And if you put a carbon tax in France, that will advantage the other country, which will become more competitive because they are not paying the taxes. So that means that there are things which are outside individualism. And these things are public goods, and especially global public goods. <laughs> the environment is a global public good or we all participate in the solution of a problem, or we will have a, a big catastrophe because we are trying to measure <coughs> the uh, uh, time which separates us from a catastrophe. Hopefully it will not uh, 
happen. Perhaps one more, Peter. John Paul, um, I think it was about two years ago, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble uh, was giving a lecture at Columbia. Uh, Could you uh, speak loudly? <laughs> Closer, okay. Is that okay? Down here? Okay, is that okay? Okay, I need a majority vote. <laughs> okay, uh, two years ago, Wolfgang Schäuble gave a lecture here at Columbia, and um, we found out that he enjoyed very much to be on a panel, and, and he enjoyed to be on a panel uh, one thing more than one Nobel laureate with two Nobel laureate. It was Joe Stieglitz and Nat. Um, uh, he was speaking about the future of Europe. Are you sure that what you said before has a chance to be realized in Europe for the simple thing that the elections in Germany have changed dramatically the power structure and we will find out that those people who have criticized Wolfgang Schäuble will probably regret very soon that he is not anymore around as the Minister of Finance. Yeah. So what are we going to do with the proposals of Macron and some of the ideas you have enlarged on? Well, uh, Peter, as usual, you are perfectly right. The change in the situation I in Germany make it, uh, makes it m much more difficult to have a, a, a French-Germany couple going in the same uh, direction. But the problem is uh, that we are going, if we don't do the things we should do to address the problem I have listed, we will, uh, we are going toward dictatorship. We are going toward democracy. We, we are going toward, toward illiberal uh, <laughs> democracy. So how long will we close our eyes and how long it will take for the politician to realize the danger of a situation. It's been a long day for some of us and um, I think I'm sure we all um, are very grateful to Jean-Paul for his wonderful edifying talk. Um, it's my enormous pleasure now to, um, to call to your attention that um, it was easy for Richard and Rob and I to um, dream up wonderful people to come to this conference and speak to us, but uh, the execution of that is very important. And um, I cannot express enough my, my deep gratitude to Lizzie Feidelson <laughs> and Catherine, Catherine Picula for working day and probably nights for many, many weeks to make this happen. Thank you very much.